Hello and welcome to How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Actually, that's just a user-friendly title for what we're really going to be talking about, and that's the subject of hermeneutics. But the word hermeneutics is a little bit intimidating, and you probably wouldn't be looking at this series with much excitement if I use that, but that's indeed what we'll be talking about, hermeneutics. But actually, more accurately, an outline of Reformed biblical hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, we're going to see, is just another word for explaining or interpreting things. And we're going to be busy talking about how we can become better interpreters of the Bible. Hence, we call it biblical hermeneutics. However, I've added the adjective reform because reformed Christians have a unique perspective on how to interpret the Bible. Of course, there's lots of overlap with broader evangelicals, and so there'll be lots that we have in common, and one or two places where I'll have a chance to highlight how, as reformed Christians, that includes uh, Presbyterians, many Anglicans, the reform camp is very, very large. That includes then how uh, reformed people have a unique, uh, maybe, angle on interpreting the scriptures. And finally, it's only an outline. Uh, I'm not pretending that we're going to cover everything. This is hopefully enough to whet your appetite and to get you to uh, hit the ground running in terms of uh, your uh, becoming a better reader of the Bible. Or, as our user-friendly title puts it, how you can read the Bible for all it's worth. And that really is the goal of our becoming uh, church leaders, not only for us to become better readers of the Bible, but also to... um, Uh, encourage and equip others to become better readers of God's Word. My name, in case you haven't watched the intro uh, video, is Jeff Wyma, and you can see from my middle initials AD that I was predestined to be a professor of New Testament. I can thank my parents for naming me wisely. And you can also see that I'm a professor uh, at Calvin Theological Seminary, which is located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, there are many things we're going to talk about, but we're going to start off first with an explanation of key terms. There are four terms that we need to understand, and not only understand these terms, but maybe even more importantly, their interrelationship with each other. And the terms are hermeneutics, exegesis, eisegesis, and homiletics. Let's begin then with that first term, hermeneutics. The word hermeneutics comes from a Greek word, hermeneia, which means literally interpretation or explanation. You can see here a book of a commentary series. And the editors thought about what to name their series, and they decided on the name hermeneia, because they thought to themselves, oh, this series will hermeneia, this series will interpret, this series will explain the Bible for uh, our readers. The word hermeneutics is a biblical term. It occurs 11 times in the New Testament. One uh, text that we can take time to read comes from Luke 24, 27, and it goes like this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, that is Jesus, dia hermeneusend, right? He explained, he interpreted to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The word hermeneutics doesn't technically occur, but it's certainly alluded to in a story of the New Testament you perhaps are familiar with. The story about how uh, during the first missionary journey, Barnabas and Paul, after engaging in a healing, were thought by the locals to be gods. And they identified Barnabas by the god Zeus, the head god, but Paul they called Hermes. Now why did they call Paul Hermes? Because Hermes, and you can see the wings on his feet, is the messenger god. So he flies around and he gives the word or he gives the explanation or the message from the gods to different people. And because Paul apparently was the apostle who was explaining, who was interpreting things, they identified him by the god Hermes. So in the word hermeneutics, we see also the reference to the Greek god Hermes. Now, Even though the word hermeneutics uh, literally means one thing, it functions differently within the biblical world, especially when you talk about textbooks and studying and so forth. The word, again, literally means interpretation, explanation, but it's used in a more broad or wide sense as a set of rules or guidelines for interpretation. So it's a broad, overarching term, and it has to do with establishing some guidelines, some principles, some rules, if you will, for how to properly interpret the Bible. Hermeneutics. 
Now, there's a distinction we ought to make right off the bat that I think is an important one, and it goes like this. Hermeneutics is often defined as, one, the science, and two, the art of biblical interpretation. It is considered a science because it has rules, and these rules can be classified into an orderly system. It is considered an art because communication is flexible, and therefore a mechanical and rigid application of rules will sometimes distort the true meaning of a communication. To be a good interpreter of scripture, one must learn the rules of hermeneutics as well as the art of applying those rules. So this quote highlights this distinction between hermeneutics as a science and hermeneutics as an art. There are others who have made this distinction. I have a quote here from the Acts of Synod. These are decisions uh, of the collective body of the Christian Reformed Church, of which I am a part. And notice how this uh, report also makes a distinction between hermeneutics as a science and hermeneutics as an art. It goes like this. Drawing up a soundly biblical hermeneutics is one thing. Applying such a hermeneutics to a given passage is another. There is nothing mechanical about the process of understanding. Understanding literature, and in this case, understanding the Bible, is an art. As art, it is not the mechanical application of a set of rules which would automatically yield uniform results. Let's think about this distinction of hermeneutics as an art and a science for a moment. So on one hand, hermeneutics, which again, we said, is the guidelines or principles for interpretation. On one hand, it's a science. Science classifies things. Science puts things in certain kind of order and analyzes them. And, and that's what we're kind of doing in this video series, right? We're, we're kind of analyzing this business of hermeneutics or interpretation. But on the other hand, it has to be an art. In other words, we just can't, in a kind of mechanical way, memorize these rules and then apply them. In other words, we can't become like robots and be programmed certain rules or guidelines and principles. If that were true, then we could do something else. We could just kind of program a computer to do all the interpretation for us. In fact, I think that's what uh, many people in a church I served uh, many years ago probably thought. When I was a seminary student some 26 or so years ago, I went for a summer assignment to serve a congregation in northern Alberta, Canada. So I was in a rural church in the middle of nowhere, and I had, I was rare in those days, I had a personal computer. And so everybody, of course, in this uh, rural community heard about their new pastor, and he came to uh, our village, he came to our area with a computer. And I really think that many of them thought I could just kind of sit behind my computer and I could kind of keyboard in the text I want to preach in and then look on the keyboard for either the Reformed or the Baptist or the Anglican or the Pentecostal button, then hit that and then out boom would pop automatically a Reformed sermon. Now, I trust you realize that that's impossible. That would be possible if hermeneutics were only a science. Right? If hermeneutics were only a set of rules and guidelines and principles, then all we'd have to do is kind of identify what they are and program some mega computer to, uh, to, 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 to learn them, and then we could just spit out automatically uh, a, a sermon, whatever we would like. But communication is not just a science, it is also an art. Now, maybe the word art is a bit misleading. I'm going to say it this way. We, we have to have wisdom in knowing how to apply the rules or guidelines of hermeneutics. Okay? You need to have wisdom to know how to apply the rules. So in our series together, we're going to be learning the different rules or guidelines or principles. And that's crucial. That's important. That's the science part of hermeneutics. But we also need to have the wisdom to know how to put those into practice. And so... Prepare yourself to be a little bit flexible, right, in the implementation of these rules. And that wisdom and that flexibility comes, frankly, just with time and experience. The more you deal with the scriptures, the more you spend time explaining and proclaiming the scriptures, I think the more wise and able you are to treat not only the science part of the interpretation process, but also the so-called art or wise side of the process. Hermeneutics as a science and hermeneutics as an art.
Now, the second term that we need to think about is the term exegesis, exegesis. And it too comes from the Greek language, and it literally means, it comes from the verb ex egeomai, it means literally to lead out, to lead out. And I love the Greek meaning because there's something very important implied in that Greek word. It implies that there is some objective truth claim found in the Bible, and then we're like explorers. We have to find what that truth claim is and, so to say, lead it out of the text in order for us to see it and for our parishioners and the people to whom we're called to minister to see it. And that actually is quite a countercultural idea because in our postmodern age, many people claim that there are no objective truths. They're only subjective truths, things that may be true for me, but not necessarily true for you. But the word exegesis presupposes that, no, there are some objective truths, and they're found in the Bible, and exegesis is the means by which we find what those truths are, and we lead them out. Exegesis. Now, what about the relationship of the term exegesis to hermeneutics? Because on one hand, they're very, very similar. Remember that hermeneutics means interpretation, explanation, and exegesis talks about leading out the meaning of a passage. But the relationship between these two terms need to be clarified. Remember I said to you that hermeneutics is the broad, overarching term, a set of rules or guidelines for interpretation. But exegesis now is when you take those rules, somewhat abstract principles or guidelines for interpretation, and then you put them into practice. So exegesis is a more narrow term, a more restricted meaning about the application of hermeneutics. Maybe if I said it this way, uh, it would help. When I come into my study to prepare to write a message or a class on a biblical passage, I come into the study, so to say, with a hermeneutic already in my mind. Even before I sit down at my desk, I have a set of questions I'm going to ask of the text. I have a, I have a, a, a set of guidelines or principles by which I'm going to approach the passage. It doesn't matter what passage of scripture I'm going to look at. I know that there are some things I ought to do. Things like take seriously what kind of genre or where in the canon it comes from. Or am I dealing with a letter, with poetry, apocalyptic, or history? I know before I even sit down and look at a passage, I have to look at the original language because I know that every translation involves interpretation. So if it's a New Testament passage, that means thinking about its Greek text. If it's an Old Testament passage, thinking about its Hebrew and possibly Aramaic background or text. I know regardless of the passage, I have to know something about its historical context. Who said it? Where did they live? To whom were they writing? What was happening in the author's life? What was happening in the audience's life? And then I also have to ask myself, even before I look at a passage, how does this passage that I'm preaching on fit within the rest of Scripture? You see, these are a set of principles. These are a set of guidelines. This is the hermeneutic, if you will, that I carry with me everywhere I go. And I use uh, whenever I open the Scriptures. But then when I finally sit behind my desk and I open the Bible, that's when I take that somewhat abstract rules or guidelines and I try to put them into practice. And then now I'm doing exegesis. I'm leading out the specific meaning of a particular passage of Scripture. So again, hermeneutics, even though it literally means interpretation, We use it in a broad sense, guidelines, principles for uh, interpretation. And then exegesis is in that more narrow or restricted sense where we take those guidelines or principles and we put them into practice. I have a little image here. It's obviously from a few years ago. I've got a little more hair uh, then than I do now. But notice the direction in exegesis. The arrow moves from the Bible to the interpreter, right? There's the truth claim, the objective truth claim found in Scripture. And now the reader or the preacher or the teacher is going to involve himself or herself in exegesis. They're going to find that truth claim and lead it out for them to see and for others to see and also to live by as well. Now, the opposite of exegesis is then this third term called eisegesis. If exegesis is to ageomai ex, even in English we have the word exit to go out, right? Eisegesis is just the opposite. It's to lead a meaning into the text. 
And this is a well-meaning, but uh, unfortunately all too common practice that many Christians engage in. And that is when they have a preconceived notion already ahead of time of what God wants or what his will is. And they find it in the text even if it isn't originally in the text. Or to put it differently, they take their preconceived interpretation and they lead it into the Bible even though it's not originally there. And again, this happens with far too much frequency. And most times, and this is what makes it kind of scary, is most people aren't even aware of what they are doing. And so it's very important for us to be aware of the danger of somehow forcing interpretations into the text or onto the text. And the more we're aware of this danger, the less likely we are to be guilty of committing it. So in a certain sense, we come to the text in a neutral way, in an open way. I know we can't come to the Bible in a completely neutral way. We're shaped by our own experiences, our own previous knowledge of the Bible, by our own culture and so forth. But in an ideal sense, we come to the Bible with a clean slate, right? I'm open to whatever it is that God may be saying to me in the text. And it won't matter whether I like it or not. In fact, there are a lot of things in the Bible that I don't find very happy or exciting. I mean, when somebody shafts me, when somebody does something mean to me, I've got to forgive them, I've got to love them. That's not something I read with eagerness or with great joy. And so it's not a matter of whether I like what I find, it's not a matter of whether I don't like. No, exegesis is, again, we're open to whatever it is that God is saying in his word. We're going to lead it out. So again, we can submit our life to God's will And we can not only understand that will, but we can teach it and proclaim it to others. I have a picture for this eisegesis, too. I forgot to advance, and you see the definitions there before you. But the picture, uh, right, is the opposite of the one I gave you before, right? In eisegesis, the interpreter, in a sense, is blind. I mean, they don't say that they are, but they really don't care what the Bible actually says because they think they already know it. And they force their meaning, the arrow, the wrong direction into the text, even though it's not originally there. Well, we've covered three of the four terms. We have now the fourth one, homiletics, to talk about, and especially its relationship to the other terms. The word homiletics, uh, likewise, comes from the Greek language. Uh, It literally means uh, conversation or speech. But the word homiletics is used today to refer to the art or the science, if you will, of preaching. If you find somebody who is a homiletician or somebody who is a homiletics professor, these are people who think carefully and seriously about preaching, right? What goes into a good sermon. Now, to understand homiletics, I want to distinguish it from, I think, exegesis. So, exegesis focuses on what the text meant. Homiletics, or preaching, deals with what the text means, or to say it slightly different, right? Exegesis focuses on God's message to his people then and there, whereas preaching or homiletics focuses on God's message to the people here and now. Now, there's a danger with this distinction, and I might as well uh, own up to it. You might not like this distinction, especially the first one. You might say, I'm driving a wedge between somehow what the Bible meant as if that were somehow different from what the Bible means. Now, that's a danger. I'm not intending it. But there's some important advantage to making this distinction. We have to first, in exegesis, focus on what God said to the people then and there. Or we have to first focus on what God was saying to the people back then. Why? Because if we too quickly jump to today, and would we do that? Yes. There's a great, great temptation for preachers and teachers to be relevant, to be practical, right? People want to take something home with them. And so there's a great, great temptation for interpreters of Scripture to spend very little, if any time, on what God was saying to the people then and there, you know, what the text meant, and to quickly jump to the here and now to what it means. And when we do that, well, we're not guaranteed to make a mistake, but we increase the possibility of making the text say something it was never intended to say. Or to put it differently, the possibility of eisegesis goes way, way up if we don't slow down, 
Yes, we want to get to what the text means, but we first want to make sure we understand what it meant. Yes, we do want to get to the here and now, but we want to first make sure we understand the then and there. So, make sure that in your interpretation of Scripture, you do due diligence to exegesis, and you avoid the temptation of too quickly jumping to the here and now. Now, am I somehow downplaying the here and now? No, not at all. That's an important part of both teaching and preaching. And let me explain to you what I can see uh, two dangers uh, here in thinking about these terms. By the way, I think I have a... I have my, I'll put up my picture here for the homiletician. Uh, the two dangers uh, are this, and that is having a sermon or a class that's all one and not the other. Right? One that's all uh, focusing on what the text meant and not enough with what the text means, or one that's all then and there and not with here and now. And uh, I'll give you uh, examples of both halves. I had a a person I know quite well who was actually a good preacher who said, I do very, very little of application. In other words, he says, I don't spend any time hardly at all in my sermons talking about what the Bible means. He says, I don't know what my hearers are going through, so I can't really make a specific application to their life. And what's more, he said, that's really the Holy Spirit's job, the Holy Spirit's responsibility. And so... um, His sermons, I guess, and they were relatively well received, but his sermons were almost all exegesis, if you will, and virtually nothing on homiletics, nothing on application. And my problem with that is, too many people today are gifted, I have to put that in quotation marks, it's one of the spiritual gifts we don't read about in 1 Corinthians 12 or 14, but far too many people today are are gifted, quote unquote, in failing to see how the text is relevant for their life. And so I think that a good preacher and a good teacher has to have enough homiletics, enough application, so that the hearer feels the force of the text in a very specific way for their life. So that's that's the one danger if you go only exegesis and you downplay application. Now, however, the other side of the equation is also dangerous, and by the way, far more common because of the spirit of our culture where people want us to be practical and relevant, it's more likely we're going to be guilty of the second danger, and that is where we have very little, if any, exegesis, and we have all in our sermon or our class, all application, all homiletics. I had a, uh, a person who had many years in ministry who explained his uh, strategy this way. He says, I do all my exegesis in the study at home, but I don't take that to the pulpit on Sunday, right? My parishioners know that I do that. They trust that I do that, but they want to hear how it's relevant for them. And so my sermons are almost all, again, application or how it is relevant for them. And I have two concerns with uh, that temptation or that tendency. The first concern I have is this. If all we have in our sermons or our classes are application, then very quickly it turns only into what my opinion is about this or that. You see, exegesis gives us the authority of the text. And so every sermon has to have enough exegesis. In other words, every sermon has to clarify clearly what God was saying then and there so that people do indeed hear the authoritative voice of God. But there's a second reason why every good sermon and every good class should have enough exegesis as well as application. And that is, if you're preaching or teaching over a long haul, over many, many years, your parishioners will learn not only the content of what you're preaching about, but they will indirectly, or they will implicitly learn how you deal with the Bible. Or to put it differently, you, through your ongoing ministry, will in a sense be teaching others your hermeneutic by how you deal with the Bible. But if you don't have any exegesis or very little in your sermons, you rob your parishioners or your hearers of the opportunity to learn that. Or I could say it this way. If you in your sermons regularly refer to the original text in Greek or in Hebrew, I would imagine that your hearers over time would say, Uh, in their own Bible study or in their own interpretation of Scripture, I wonder if I had some information about the original language, if that would help me better understand this passage. 
Or if you're the kind of preacher who regularly uh, goes back in time and explains maybe practices in the Jewish world or common attitudes or activities in the Roman world, I could imagine that your parishioners or your hearers would, when they come across certain passages, especially if they're wondering about what it means, might say to themselves, I wonder if I knew more about Judaism. I wonder if I knew more about the Greco and the Roman world, whether that would help me become a better understander of this particular passage. And if you're the kind of person who regularly interprets Scripture with Scripture, right, then I can imagine your hearers not just blindly looking at one passage in isolation from the rest of the canon, but they would say somewhere along the line, I wonder how this passage fits within other passages of Scripture that deal with the same topic or subject. So I'm suggesting to you that every sermon or every good sermon should have an appropriate amount of exegesis and an appropriate amount of homiletics or application. Now, how much of each? Well, that will depend from passage to passage. Some passages are dealing with situations that the modern reader hardly knows about and is puzzled about. And so you need a fair amount of time to exegete the text, to explain and to be sure about what God was saying to the people then and there. However, there are other passages of the scriptures that are quite simple and easy to understand. If we have a text like John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There, there isn't a a lot we have to explain. Actually, there you've got to take something that's almost too well known and think in creative ways about how you can get your hearers to hear the force of that gospel message. So I'm going to say it this way. I think that there should be enough exegesis in every sermon or class for people to hear the authoritative voice of God. And also enough so that over a long time, they can be implicitly or indirectly taught how they should read the Bible for all it's worth. And there should be enough application so that the hearer doesn't fail to see how the text is relevant for his or her life. There should be enough application so that the Holy Spirit has some fertile soil to take that truth claim that you have discovered through your exegesis and you have presented now to your audience. Well, permit me to say one more uh, important thing about this larger discussion of hermeneutics before we bring our first session to a close. And this has to do with uh, the criteria by which people listen or evaluate a sermon. Nowadays, uh, people judge uh, a good sermon, I think, with these three criteria. Number one, Uh, how long is a sermon, and long is bad. In fact, I do have a motto that I try to follow. I'm not always good at it, but the motto is, the longer I am, the better I better be. The longer I am, the better I better be. In other words, if I'm going to be long and people are impatient, I better have my best stuff, right? So short rather than long. Second criteria is how how interesting the message is, and preferably funny. People want our pastors to be interesting, to capture their attention, and if possible, to make them laugh. And then the third one is one we've already talked a little bit about, and that is how relevant the message is. Because again, the people are ruthlessly pragmatic nowadays, and they want to take something home with them. So the three criteria I suggest to you by which people far too often judge a sermon or a devotional or whatever else that they are dealing with in connection with Scripture is how long or short is it, how interesting, preferably funny it is, and also how practical or relevant it is. Now the sad and sobering truth is I can preach a sermon that's not very long, I can be quite confident you'll find it interesting, maybe even get you to laugh once in a while, and I can give you some three or five or whatever many steps, some marching order for you to take home and to apply to your life. But notice I've never once asked in this three criteria how faithful the text or the sermon is to the biblical text. How faithful was the exegesis to the original text? And my goal for this series of how to read the Bible for all it's worth is to get you to be not only a better reader of Scripture, but maybe to have a different set of criteria by which to judge a good or a bad sermon, by a good interpretation or a bad interpretation. In fact, um, sometimes people, when they hear me, they complain. They say, oh, you, you ruin the way I listen to a sermon. 
Although I'd like to think that even though the experience may be unhappy, it ultimately is a good one. Because maybe now you'll suddenly discover after this series that we'll be working on together that maybe the preacher you thought was so good, well, actually maybe isn't so good after all. I mean, he may be short, he or she may be interesting and funny and may be practical, but how faithful is he or she to the biblical text? That's a crucial question for you to ask and answer. And conversely, a preacher that maybe you weren't so impressed with, maybe suddenly now you have a more grudging respect for him or her. I mean, I'd like this preacher to be more interesting. I'd like this preacher to be more short and brief. And I'd like this preacher to be more practical and relevant. But this preacher maybe does an excellent job in exegesis. And so maybe you have a deeper appreciation for this pastor or preacher than you did before. Well, friends, uh, we've got the basic terms Uh, kind of analyzed and presented. And uh, now we're, so to say, ready to continue this very, very crucial discussion of how to read the Bible for all it's worth.